request, we'd ask your attention to the book of Revelation, uh, John's Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, and I, meaning John the Apostle, and I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. I'd like to preach the Lord being my helper this evening on the thought, let's crown him with many crowns. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for your blessings from time to time. Lord, we thank you for the hedge that you've placed around this place, Lord. And we pray for your guidance and direction. Lord, help us as a people that we would be in this little community a light standing in the last days. Lord, there's so much going under the name of preaching and under the name of religion, but Lord, lack substance and truth, Lord. So we pray that we might be a shining light in this place, Lord. We pray for the lost. Lord God, touch them and stir them up and make them to know of their sinfulness and of your gratefulness, Lord. And we would be giving you great praise and honor for it. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, reading from the book of Revelation, and sometimes the more I study the book of Revelation, the less I think I understand. But one thing I know, or I think I know, is a portion of it is to the churches, and that is the first three chapter. A portion of it is to Israel, and a portion of it is to both. And that, that's kind of the mindset you've got to have when you begin studying the book of Revelation. And this is the section to, to both. It is when both are addressed, both are one in, in that sense, and they're being addressed together as one body. And so he begins in verse 11, and I saw heaven open. Now that is a rare occurrence. You do see it a few times in scriptures. There are times when the Lord God ascended into glory. Heaven was open. When Stephen looked upward and saw heavens open and, and saw the Lord Jesus ready to receive him, uh, we find that uh, Enoch was taken, but we don't really know how exactly it was opened then. And then we know when Elijah was taken, it was opened again. But here we see that the Bible says that heaven was open. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing just for a moment if we could see heaven open and see the glory of God? Now, the reason that does not happen is because if we did, we would have to die. You cannot see the glory of God and live. And so, uh, but it would be a wonderful thing to see this event. And he says, and behold, a white horse. Now, the white horse is purity. The white horse is for royalty. The white horse bears the king of kings, and he rides in as a victor. And he, sat upon, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Now, uh, remember this, if you don't get anything out of this tonight, remember that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God of heaven also, is always faithful. Uh, we, we may not see it, we may not understand it at the time, but a dear friend of mine told me the other day that uh, a Mennonite friend of hers said this, and, and, and she was struggling with some things my friend was, didn't quite understand what was going on in her life, and, and, and upset about some things, and, and, and she said to this woman, she says, remember, when the teacher's given a test, he's always silent. And that left, that left a big mark with me because as a teacher myself, uh, I don't allow my, question, uh, my students to ask me any question until the test is done. And then if they have questions, they can address me then. And many times the Lord Jesus wants to show you what you're made out of. And you may not hear from God. You know, in some of his deepest days, David did not hear from God. It was after the testing that it occurred that he began to hear from God again. And so we see that God is faithful no matter what. And the second thing we find, that he is true. If he's assuring you of salvation, 
that's true. And if he is saying, no, you do not have the real deal, then that has to be true as well. He's faithful and He's true. He will give you truth and not only that, He's true to you. Uh, uh, 28 years and a week or two, uh, me and Donna have been married and I have been the, the best of my ability. I have been true to her wholeheartedly and she has to me. That's the relationship that a believer has with Christ. He, he's not a two-timer. He's not going to go against you. He's there and He's faithful. And so with these two characteristics of, of the Lord Jesus, what more could you want? And what more could you need is a faithful and true witness. Then he says, And in righteousness he doth, doth judge and make war. Now you remember this, whatever judgment Christ gives, it's correct. If he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. You're a fake, you're a charlatan, you're a fraud. It's true. And if he says, enter ye in, well done, my, thou good and faithful servant. It's true. You can bank on it. You can depend on it. It's the real deal. Now, so the events that happen after this, it, some he would judge, some he would, uh, he would uh, commendate, and we find that those were, those were things that you can depend on. They were righteous because God did, did them. Verse 12, his... His eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, that doesn't mean that he was burning in his eyes. That don't mean he had flames shooting out. It meant that he could look in the dark places and see the truth. Now, I can't do that. And some of, you, some of us about convinced ourselves that we can. But we don't know when someone's a fake and when somebody's real. But God does. He knows if you're lost. He knows if you're saved. He knows when you're faking. And He knows when it's real. He knows it all. And you know what? Sometimes when I really begin to get a, con a grasp of that, it's very humbling that God knows more about me than I know about myself. That's very humbling. That, 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 that may, makes me concerned and, and it worries me sometimes. But I do know it's the truth. And, and from that, we can say this. Depend on God. And you know what? Let Him search you out. Let Him look real good through you. Uh, let, let Him uh, thoroughly search you out. And when there's a problem, deal with it. You know, sometimes when my kids were coming up, I just had to say deal with it. That means work it out yourself. This is the statute. You can deal with it or you can leave. Right? You say, well, that's harsh parenting. Well, when you have a house full of teenagers, we'll talk about it again. Uh, but that, that, that's, that's, that's how it was. So, if you're not being illuminated, there's a real problem. You know what? None of us have arrived yet. So there is problems in each and every one of us on a daily basis. And what I would love for in my own life is that if I could be illuminated and see what the problem is and deal with it, then that draws me closer to the Lord. And that ought to be the life's desire of every, of every Christian is to be closer. And so his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, plural. Now, we cannot get the magnificence of Christ up in this little empty noggin that we have. But He will be crowned with many crowns. He is magnificent. He's holy. He is the Lord of it all. And He will be crowned with many, 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 many crowns. Now the question is this, not if it's going to happen, the question is this, and we'll see with the Lord's help, are you going to be participating in that great day? Are you going to be a bystander? Are you just going to be an onlooker? What, what, what is your role going to be in that day? Because listen, not everybody's going to be casting crowns. You know, there, uh, there's a, uh, uh, I, I don't know that much about it, I know they say, uh, a contemporary Christian group called Casting Crowns. Now, I don't know if they really know what they're talking about, but they, in their name, they do have a point. 
is that we will be casting crowns before the Lord Jesus. Have you ever thought, are you going to bring anything to the, thr to the throne room of Christ to cast before Him? That's something to be thought about. That's something to consider. That, that's something that we need to know of each of, of ourselves. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. I just want to pick that up. I read it in your reading very short ago, maybe in my last sermon. If not the one before that, Revelation 4 and verse 10. The Bible says, And four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. So we find the, 12, the 24 elders, and, and we, if you remember, we talked about their identity is not given. A lot of people make a lot of hypothesis about that, and they may well be right. I don't know, but I will say this, they don't know either. Right? Uh, I, I don't know who those 24 men or glorified beings are, but I do know this. They had the mindset to glorify God. Now, what is your mindset? Is your mindset just on the here and now? And let me get through this day, and, and tomorrow we'll do something else. Let me get through this moment. Or is your mind on eternity? To cast crowns one day, you have to look past Dover, Tennessee. To cast crowns, you got to look past August the 3rd, 2016. To cast crowns, you have to have a vision that goes beyond the here and now. Because, listen, casting crowns is glorifying God, but it takes the use of your effort. Now, you know what? This life goes by like that. And I know I say that frequently, but I say it to the benefit of you young people. Listen to me. Listen to what I say. Use the here and now. What, did, what was the wisest man that ever lived? In Solomon Ecclesiastes, he says, Remember thy Creator in the days of thy youth when the hard times cometh not. You know what? Hard times are coming. Your health will fail you. I mean, that, that's part of the depravity of man. You may, you may have a good time of it, you may not. I knew a, I knew a man over, uh, and I talked to, uh, we said something about Central Baptist Church recently. An elderly man in there preached on his 103rd birthday and died about four weeks later. But we're not, most of us are not that blessed. Most of us are not that blessed. And so we find then we have to be very deliberate if we're going to be involved in casting crowns. And we find here that the four and twenty elders did it. We find in Revelation 19 that, that this, uh, this one that was to be praised had, had these, uh, this, uh, these many crowns on. So where do, you, where do we fit in in all of that? Go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, you all know that the Corinthian church wasn't the model church. Um, they had lots and lots of problems. There, there was lots of difficulty. And I will say this, that the, their base problem was this. They would not deal with sin in the group. That was their base problem. Now, they had other problems going on. But if they had took care of that, then the other problems would have never surfaced. And, and, and so we see then that we have a very average church for today. A picture in the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. The Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, you don't add anything to the means of salvation. You don't add baptism. You don't add church membership. You don't add good works. The foundation is Christ and Christ alone. If you're trusting anything differently than for salvation than that, you have a little problem. You know, I, I read a little, and I, I, I like some things Spurgeon had to say. I'm not a fanatic about him like some people are. But I, I read a little thing today on Facebook that, that he said that really clicked with me. And he says, free will is nothing but the doctrine of a sinful nature. And that really hit home. 
Because we want something we can do. If it's, if it's something as simple as saying a sinner's prayer, we want to be able to do it. And that's nothing more than reflecting how, how ungodly we really are. Because what, what, what the reality is, is it's all of God. It's all of Him. And we simply don't like that. We simply don't like that. And, and so we see then that... Don't add anything to Christ, Christ and Christ alone. Verse 12, Now if any man build upon the foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work. Work, works are very, very important. We need to understand that there is a great role of works in the kingdom, and more important than the kingdom, than in glorifying God. That there is, uh, works is a, a needful thing. Now when I say needful, notice I did not say necessary, but works are a needful thing. If you don't want to stand ashamed before God one day, you need some works. I believe uh, the problem is today that Baptists have left works out altogether. When works are a reality, you just have to put them in the right place. You have to have them where they ought to be. They're not for salvation, but they're because of salvation. They're described in many different ways in our text. Gold, jewels, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. They're given different types and so that would mean we need to look at our types of work too. What are you doing? Or what are you not doing? What are you, what are you involved in? What do you avoid? Because it's very important that we know the role of works. This is the scary part. Verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest or obvious or evident for the day for the day shall declare it, shall it, for it shall be re revealed by fire. Now all my life I have been taught that that is the great judgment. The only problem is that don't fit. The great judgment is now. It is why you're living. It's what you do on a daily basis. You know what? I had. There was a person I recently got a letter from, and she said she she made the allegation that all I knew was to preach separation. Well, so what? I, I think that's a good testimony, don't you? It didn't it didn't bother me, but I didn't take it as an insult. But if this individual or a individual, if you or anyone else are doing it to please me, it will be revealed because the Bible says the hog will return to his wallow. So the testing of your works are now and not then. Why? Because he knows what you're made out of. He, he don't need to gain knowledge. How can an omnipotent God gain knowledge? That's foolishness. He wants you to know it. And more than all, that he wants the world to know it. You know what? If you're a faith, it shall be found out. Uh, most assuredly, it will come out. And, and so we see then in this, in this event that they were going to be tried and tested. That's another reason I think that's kind of moved to the end uh, of, the, of the judgment day is because we don't want to think about being judged and, and being going through fire here. If any man's work abides, Last, there, continually. If any man's work abide which he had built thereon, of thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now that should be your goal, to receive a reward. If any man's works, if any man's work shall be burned, that consumed, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, that, that should make us shake in our seat to think that the Spirit of God, the big S Spirit,
Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, that third person in the triune God is dealing with you, is dwelling with you, and we drag him through the muck and the mire every day. We drive him through the muck and mire in the workplace. We drive him through the muck and the mire at the schoolhouse. We drive him through the muck and the mire on Facebook. Listen, remember who dwells within you. You remember you're not by yourself. And if you can do some of those things, dear friend, I'm here to tell you, you may not have what you think you have. You know, it, it, it'll make us cry like a baby when we think about some of the places that we've taken the Holy Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. it, it, it'll make us upset. I mean, frequently it don't. So I want you to see then that the first thing is there is going to be trials. There is going to be a way that you can know the type of works that you have. Are they real or are they fake? Do you enjoy preaching or do you blow it off? Do you uh, look for the time to go home? Where are you really at? It's very important when we think of end time judgment to know exactly uh, where we're at. Now go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. Paul writes, writing to the church at Thessalonica says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? So I want you to see, he says, what is my crown of rejoicing? You are. This church, Thessalonica, you are my crown of rejoicing. Now, I'll say two things there. Men that are preaching men and pastoring men, they have a huge responsibility. You are under my care. And, and, and it, should, it should make me shake in my boots to think that I pastor one of the Lord's true churches. It should upset me. It should get me to thinking about what I'm going to preach next instead of thumbing through some stupid book of sermon outlines. It should make you quake in your shoes. Now secondly, if you're not rejoicing, you have the problem, not God. It is within us as a people if we do not rejoice. A crown of rejoicing. Now you think about back across your life. Now I'll be 48 in December. How much of that time have I spent rejoicing? I mean really heartfelt rejoicing. One of the biggest thrills of my life the first time we went to Mexico, up into uh, that, uh, that tiny village in the Oaxacan Mountains where there wasn't even electricity. The first time we, there was no electricity there. And I remember the sister, the pastor's sister, uh, I mean his wife, made us corn cakes. They were purple. Like a big tortilla. Huge thing. And boiled us chicken. And... It blessed my heart. She fixed the very best she had. And you know that that you know I, I, I probably rejoiced over that meal more than any meal I ever ate in my life. And you know what? I think it'll be a crown for her one day. I really do. And and we pass all this stuff up and we get we get so busy doing and listen, I'm guilty too doing all this and you know uh, what are we missing? What, what, when we got our nose in a book or our nose uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a phone, what are we missing around us? What is the spiritual blessings that, that we have missed just because we weren't there? So, <laughs> we need to look for times to rejoice. We need to find every day something that we might rejoice about. Every day look for a blessing in what we see and do. And more than that, that you might be for somebody else, that you might be that blessing as well. Look at me in the book of James. James chapter 1 and verse 12. We see another crown. 
Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. But when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Now, let me say this. That doesn't mean that the ones that don't endure not, are not saved. But they do not have a crown of life. There is a huge difference. What is your life spoke of since the day the Lord saved you? What, what, what has been the meat of your substance? Cars, automobiles, homes, houses, land, makeup, purses, dresses. Really, I mean, what, 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 what has your substance been about? Because all the things that I just named, they are going to burn up. They are going to be consumed. There'll be nothing whatever left. So we see that our crown of life is something that we should look for and, and, and it really does depend on how we spend the majority of this time that we live and breathe in this place and at this time. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life. Now this temptation of the devil you know we get in our mind Oh, it's going to be a pretty woman that comes in and tries to lose me away from my wife. The devil is not that, that stupid. It might be a career. Or it might just be this. And you sit here and waste months and months. And you like and you unlike and you make comments. And there's your temptation. Or it could be a hundred other things. I use that one because it's so prevalent today. And I'm, I'm, I'm grouping myself there. So don't think it's all four fingers are pointing at you. I understand what. But what, do you, what does your life consist of? What, what, what is your main purpose? What do you spend the majority? And you say, well, I don't know what my main purpose is. Well, I'll ask it in simpler terms. What do you mostly do? And if you'll answer what you mostly do, that is your main purpose. That makes sense? And so, whatever that is for you, you know, and men, I understand, I have to work just like you do, but that's eight, seven, eight hours of your day. What do you do with the rest of your time? What, what? And, and then I'll go a step further, and of each day, how much do you pray before the mighty God of heaven? How much do you study? And so this crown of life is not just a give me that everybody will receive. It's for those that, that are faithful. Which the Lord had promised to them that love Him. Now, how did, what, what's an indication that you love the Lord? Well, what's an indication that I love Donna? Now, I tell a lot of people I do, but is, is that really an indication? I don't think so. Do you? I mean, I'd say I love a dog. L love's cheap. I'll say this, the term love is cheap. Real love is not cheap, but the term love is cheap. But I hope that Donna knows that I love her because I get up and I hit the bricks every morning so that we might have something when we get home to eat each night. I hope that she knows I love her because I want the very best for her. I hope that, that she sees it portrayed in my life because that's the only way I know to show her. And that's the really only way you can show him. Now... A lot of people think that me and Don have a very strange little relationship, but all I can say is God hooked up, hooked up two people that are not mushy over anything. We have a very, you know, uh, she knows that I love her, I know she loves me, and we don't sit around and talk about it all the time. But we certainly show that we do. So, uh, that, that is what the essence of this is. What do you spend the bulk majority of your time doing? Do you show that you love it? 
You show that you want to honor Christ in every way. So that is the crown of life. It's mentioned one other time in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. I want to, I want to pick this up. Revelation, chapter 2, and verse 10. The Bible says, For none of those things which thou suffer, fe um, excuse me, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tri tri tribulation ten days. But be, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So we find again this crown of life hinges on what? Faithfulness. Now, there's not anybody under the sound of my voice that has not failed the Lord tremendously. But, it should be our natural desire to say, Lord, I'm sorry. And tomorrow I'm going to do the very best I can. That's right. That, that's faithful service. But if you're never troubled in that way, then I would be very concerned about my salvation. I'd be very concerned. If you don't love the Lord more than you love your wife, if you don't love the Lord and cling to Him even more than your children, something is desperately wrong. You will not receive a, a crown of life by a halfway service. Rather, you'll be saved so as by fire. And that means you'll have nothing. Nothing, nothing to lay at the feet of Jesus. The crown that that Paul addressed the Corinthian church with, I believe, was a crown of ministry. He says, you are my crown. You know what? Take it or leave it, you are my crown. <laughs> I don't know what that says for me, and I don't know what it says for you either. But I, knew that the, I do know that it's the Bible. Church in South Road. You know what? 22 years later, I can say I made a mess out of it. Something that did right, something I was a hothead 25 year old boy. But, good and bad, that was one of my crowns. And it well could be that it would be consumed by fire. Now, many points, you know, how hard headed people can be, I still think I'm right. But, the point is, we all have our so that, 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 is the, that is the crown of ministry. Look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul addressing young Timothy for the last time. In new modern day language, Timothy, uh, Paul knew the gig was up. He knew the time was just about done. He knew that the Roman had his head numbered. He knew that the Jews had him numbered. He knew his ministry was nearing an end. You know what? It never ceases to amaze me that the majority of people who call themselves Christian do not get concerned about meeting the Lord until death draws near. You know what? I'm concerned about meeting Him face to face right now. I'm concerned about going out and meeting Him in the air and have nothing to lay before His precious feet. That, that's a real fear of mine. And it ought to be a real fear of you. You say, well, how can, can I tell well, you look around this room, and I'm as serious as a, as a triple bypass. Can you say you love everybody in this room? Love, are you happy to be here tonight? Joy? You get a peaceful feeling when you come in among God's people? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's when you're here on the good days and on the bad days. All of them together. The fruits of the Spirit are a telltale sign. And if you don't like coming to the house of God, you have a big problem somewhere. Right. Now, every, every message ain't going to be, woo, you know, let's run down the pews. But I still like to be here. I, I still be, enjoy meeting with God's people. And if you don't, then definitely there, th th this is a, a crown that might not be with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he gives his final farewell address. He tells us about staying faithful. And at the very end, verse 7, 
He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He makes three wonderful statements. The first thing he says, I have fought a good fight. Now, I will point out this. He was a very honest man, and he did not say, I fought a perfect fight. I fought a good fight. And I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what your tribulations may be. But I'll say this. Fight a good fight. I mentioned South Road Baptist Church. You know what? For what I knew at the time, I fought a good fight. It wasn't perfect, but I fought a good fight. What I've done here, I have fought a good fight. It wasn't perfect. I've made mistakes. I, I, I've said things probably that were better left unsaid. And probably more times than not... <laughs> I didn't say some things that should have been said. And, and pastors don't like to admit that. But sometimes we just have to say, hey, you know, what's the problem? What's your deal? Paul did. And, and so we see then that we as the, uh, as the servant of the Lord, we ought to be able to say at least I have fought a good fight. Not perfect, but good. Then he says... I have finished my course. Yeah. Now, a course is laid out for you. I'm not a golfer. And every, I, I put a club in my hand one time, and I felt, I felt very stupid. Uh, this is not something I need to waste my time with, and I wasn't even on a golf course. I carried Brother Krabs from this building over to my house, and I was like, how could people do this all day long and be interested in it? But he's, a course is laid out. You've got 9 or 18 holes. It's, they're all a goal. You hit that little ball and you aim for the spot. And that's your whole goal is to get it done. Courses laid out, some courses you know, some that you don't. Our course is laid out whether we, now we don't know it. We don't know what, where, where, the, where the pitfalls are going to be. But our course is laid out and Paul knew that his time was just about up. He knew he was just about done. He says, I finished my course. This part is done. I'm almost through with this. So he fought a good fight. He finished what God had laid him out to do. Then he says something very important. I have kept the faith. Know that you have the faith. Not what somebody told you. But that you know what this says. That you studied it deeply for yourself. You know, the first time I heard of the doctrine of the election, my flesh reared up and said, there's no way. But I studied it, and it was there. I mean, Donna had many discussions when we were dating. Unfortunately, we dated. We didn't know nothing about courtship. And we discussed the apparel for a woman and apparel for a man. She gave me the verses. So, you know what? Yeah, that's there. <laughs> now, what I say about it, right? That's the faith. He, he had kept what he... So, the first thing is knowing what the faith is, and the second thing is keeping it. You know what the faith is, and you know it for yourself, not because brother so-and-so told you, not because you went to this church or that church, that you know for yourself. And know, and, and know that for certain... And that's how Paul was leaving it. Henceforth is laid up for, for me a crown of righteousness. Now that's a very unusual crown. Because it is not a crown of life. It's not a crown of ministry like those church crowns we talked about in 1 Corinthians. It's a crown of righteousness. Holiness. He, 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 he had suffered some things and stood right in them. He had suffered some things. and Remember when he was before Agrippa, what did he say? He said, I count myself happy, O King Agrippa, that I am permitted to speak for myself. You know what? That took something, didn't it? Not, not everybody has that. And so as, as he's ending his final statements to Timothy, and he's, fixing, he's fixing to be killed himself, he, he says, I, there is a crown of righteousness waiting for me. So we as the Lord's believers 
ought to always be ready to give a good account of ourselves. We should always be desirous of a crown. Something to lay at the feet of Jesus. Something. And, I, and listen, we get so mixed up and muddled up with things of this world, sometimes we forget why we're here. But what we need to do is continue in the faith. What we need to do is give the Lord glory and honor that is due His name. We need to be faithful. Mm -hmm. All right.